Hey Carson, you're the dumbest kid in the world. <laughs> you weren't meant to be a failure, Bennett. And you can control your temper, but and you can bring your grades me. up too, oh. I know you can. <laughs> I'm dumb, mother. No, you ain't. You a smart boy. You're gonna go to the library and pick out two books, and at the end of the week, you're gonna hand me a written report about what you read. Why you waste all that time watching the TV? If you use that time to develop your God-given gifts, wouldn't be long before folks was watching you on TV. Mother, I wanna be a doctor. You can be anything you wanna be in this life, as long as you're willing to work at it. You can do anything anyone else can do. Only you, you can, can do, do it better. <laughs> I first heard about Ben Carson in 2003, and as soon as I heard the story, I thought we must get that man involved with books and homes. It's so inspirational what his mother did, and it shows kids can go from nothing to being the best in the world. The person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. Just seeing the children yesterday was, was phenomenal. Seeing that facility filled up with children who had bust in from everywhere and then calling out Ben's name. Uh, I mean I've never heard so much energy, I've never seen children so fired up and I'm getting so much feedback back from the teachers who are saying their kids are fired up and they want to be doctors. You rise to the top if you have the right mindset and just don't sort of give up and say, oh, poor me, I'm a victim. The 61st Annual National Prayer Breakfast. One speaker getting even more media attention than President Obama. We spend a lot of money on health care, twice as much per capita as anybody else in the world, and yet not very efficient. So about 15 minutes after it ended, I got a phone call from the organizers mm -hmm. saying that the White House was very upset and that I need to call the president and apologize. When did we reach a point where you have to have a certain philosophy because of the color of your skin. We already spend way more than enough money on health care, and I want to do it in such a way that we put the power in the hands of the people to control their own health care and put that relationship, that doctor-patient relationship, back together. Do you have presidential aspirations? It is not something that I desire to do, mm -hmm. but I have so many people asking me, uh, and as a patriotic American, I, I certainly have to think about it, but it wasn't what I was thinking about when I retired. Success is determined not by whether or not you face obstacles, but by your reaction to them. And if you look at those obstacles as a containing fence, they become your excuse for failure. Thank you. Well, always delighted to come to the beautiful country of New Zealand. This is actually the fourth time uh, that I've been here. And uh, really, we're here to, uh, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Duffy Books and Homes. And uh, today at uh, Parliament in Wellington, uh, the 10 millionth book was presented. And uh, to me, it, it, it's really very poignant because, you know, my life was changed so dramatically by reading. And it was, it's such an empowering thing. And uh, I actually believe that physicians and people in healthcare are some of the very best people to be pushing education because we are actually the most educated people on the planet. Nobody has as much education as, uh, as physicians do. And yet, uh, we frequently have a tendency to confine ourselves to our laboratories and our operating rooms and our societies and kind of uh, exclude ourselves from the populace. I, I think that's probably uh, a mistake. And uh, I'm fond of telling people in America that five physicians were involved in the Declaration of Independence. And physicians also signed the Constitution and uh, the Bill of Rights. And we used to be much more involved in what was going on. And 
I think things were going a whole lot better then too, you know? <laughs> Physicians rather than lawyers, you know? But, uh, and, and people always seem to think that it's strange when physicians get involved in, in things outside of medicine. But no one seems to think it's strange when lawyers get involved in things outside of law. I just, I see something wrong with that. And I always encourage more physicians. And, and the reason I encourage physicians and scientists to get involved, particularly in the public arena, is because we're trained to make decisions based on evidence as opposed to on ideology. And you're always going to do better when you make decisions based on evidence. So, but at any rate, I would have to say that we're also dealing with the most important things that people have. You know, when I was an intern at Johns Hopkins, I was duly impressed. I would go in those wards and I would see all these people. The CEO of this company, president of this organization, crown prince, queen of this nation, in many cases dying of some horrible disease. And every single one of those people would have gladly given every penny and every title for a clean bill of health. And you begin to understand what we are dealing with by far the most important thing a person has. And people really don't think about it that often. But if you had the choice of having a billion dollars, but you had to be quadriplegic, or no money, but you were whole, I don't think it would take many people very long to figure out which one they would take. So when you talk about value of what we're dealing with, there is nothing that's more valuable. And that's why I'm so adamant about the fact that the most important thing that you have should be under your control and not under the control of somebody else. Now, you know, I did retire last year. Some people say, well, why did you retire? I had a very good reason to retire. Somebody told me that neurosurgeons die early. <laughs> and. Uh, I didn't believe it, so I wrote down the names of the last 10 neurosurgeons I knew who died, calculated the average age of death, and it was 61. <laughs> and um, I said, if I'm still alive, I'm going to retire when I'm 61. So that's why I decided that that was probably a very good time to do it. But uh, it was a, a wonderful career. I had an opportunity to operate on about 15,000 people. I still see a lot of my patients uh, all over the place, and that is extraordinarily <coughs> gratifying. I remember my birthday last year. I was in Alabama speaking, and uh, there were about 2,000 people, and we had Q&A afterwards, and a lady way in the back stood up and raised her hand. She said, I want to wish you a happy birthday. And uh, she said, 20 years ago, I gave birth to a little baby girl who had such severe cranial deformities, everybody said, let her die. Everybody but you. You were the only one who were willing to do anything. And not only do I want to wish you a happy birthday, but here is my 20-year-old daughter to present you with a cake. I'll tell you, that was just such a wonderful feel. Everybody was so emotional. But you know, to be able to see those kinds of things and to realize that, that you've had the privilege of being able to intervene in someone's life in that manner is probably more gratifying than virtually anything else you do. You know, I sit on a couple of Fortune 500 corporate boards with uh, some extremely well-known and very wealthy people. And uh, they're always saying to me, you know, what you do is so much more important than anything that we do. They all recognize it. And, you know, we should be extraordinarily proud, but also humbled by the fact that people put into our hands the most important thing that they have. And it's our job to give it back to them in an enhanced way. But, you know, as a physician, you know, I was pretty much focused like everybody else on 
here's the patient. What can we do to get this patient well? And, uh, you know, things were going along very well. I have nothing to complain about. But about 12 years ago, something happened. All of a sudden, I would be in the operating room, and the clock became important to me. I used to have what's known as a camel's bladder. I could operate all day, never have to take a break. All of a sudden, I needed to take a break. I said, something's going on here. And I went and talked to my good buddy, Pat Walsh, who was the chairman of urology. And uh, I said, Pat, what do you think's going on? He said, eh, you probably got a little prostatitis. Let's try a little antibiotic. That didn't work. He said, I bet you got a little focal hypertrophy. Let's try some Flomax. Well, that didn't work. He said, well, I know you had a PSA and it, it wasn't very elevated, but let's just repeat it. It was slightly elevated. He said, I think you should have a prostate biopsy. Now, if anybody ever told you a prostate biopsy doesn't hurt, <laughs> it doesn't hurt them, okay? <laughs> they left that one word out. I mean, after about the six core biopsy, I'm saying, you know what, cancer's not that bad. Let's just, <laughs> it's okay. But, uh, you know, once it was done, you know, he said, you know, very little chance that you have cancer, maybe 18% top chance. I said, nevertheless, I need to know as soon as you know something. So the next day I'm operating, get a call, a nurse holds the phone up to my ear, and I hear, not only do I have prostate cancer, but I have a very aggressive form of prostate cancer. I subsequently got an MRI done to make sure it hadn't metastasized. And I was expecting when I came out of the MRI, a neuroradiologist to be there to say, everything's fine, no worries. But there was no neuroradiologist there to say that. And the technician handed me my films, and I went up to my office and put them up on the view box. And my heart sank, because I saw all these lesions up and down my spine. I checked the name to make sure it was me, and it was. And I just went and sat down at my desk and started contemplating. And I remember when I was a kid, nine years old, sitting on the ghetto stairs, looking through the building across the street out of which all the windows had been broken. And a sunbeam was streaming through it. It made me think about my life and the future. And I remember thinking that I would probably never live to be more than 25 years old because that's what I saw around me. Both my favorite cousins were killed. I saw people on the street with bullet holes and stab wounds, and that's just what I figured. There I was twice that age, and I said, you have nothing to complain about. It's been a good life. And then my senior PA came in, who's been with me my entire career, also retired when I retired. And she said, let me see it, let me see it. I knew it wasn't gonna show anything. I said, it's over there on the board. And she went and looked at it, came back with the longest face imaginable. The next day, on the radio, they were announcing that I had a, a glioblastoma. And then I had lung cancer, liver cancer, bone cancer. You name it, I had it. I was dying. I had died already. <laughs> <laughs> One lady called from Boston, and she said, I heard Dr. Carson was dead. I want to speak to him. I mean, it was, uh, <laughs> it was just amazing. But, uh, but the outpouring of sentiment really impressed me. I mean, we had 10 big bags of cards and letters from all over the world, from janitors to the president and the first lady, saying that they were praying for me. I had no idea that so many people cared. And uh, I think the Lord just got tired of hearing about me because it turned out that the lesions on the MRI were a congenital anomaly of the bone marrow. It just looked like metastasis. And I was able to have surgery by Pat Walsh, who invented the nerve-sparing prostatectomy. And I'm cancer-free today, 12 years later. So, you know, it all worked out in a, in a very nice way. But during that episode, people sent me so much stuff. I mean, it was like, FedEx, every five minutes, was coming to the door with some potions and some pills and, 
you know, all kinds of things that people were sending me, but also literature, all kinds of literature. I started, you know, digesting all this stuff, and it really dawned on me how incredibly important nutrition is, and the whole concept of wellness is in our lives. And so much of medicine is directed toward sickness, and so little of it directed toward wellness. And I really came to the conclusion that if everybody ate three well-balanced meals a day, drank six to eight glasses of water or water equivalent substances, exercised regularly, got regular sleep, and did not put harmful substances in their bodies, most of us would be out of work. We have nothing to worry about. They're not going to do it. <laughs> That's a fact. But, you know, we, we need to be thinking about policies, things that actually incentivize people to do the right thing. Because I think that's where we're really going to be able to, to, you know, have a lot of savings. But that also got me very interested in health care reform. And, you know, I have been working with a number of people in the United States. Now, you know, the left wing doesn't like me because I don't like Obamacare. Uh, but there's a reason that I don't particularly like it. And you've heard part of it. It's because your health is the most important thing you have. There is nothing else you have that even comes close to that. And to put that in the hands of bureaucrats I don't think it's a good idea. And, you know, the big scandal, the big VA scandal, I'm sure you heard about that even over here, uh, with people dying, not being able to get care. I've had an opportunity to work in some VA hospitals. And there are many extremely fine people who work in these VA hospitals. But the problem is there are so many layers of bureaucrats between those fine people and the patients, that things get delayed inordinately. And it hurts those people. You know, it hurt me to see that. But, you know, I said in one interview that it was a blessing from God, the VA scandal, because it shows us what happens when you put layers and layers of bureaucracy between people and healthcare providers. Of course, the left-wing media immediately came out and said, Carson says that God wants veterans to die. I mean, it's just, <laughs> I get a kick out of them, to be honest with you. It seems like the more they attack me, the more popular I become because they're so ridiculous. But, uh, but, it, but at any rate, you know, I don't think people actually need to be enemies about it because what we really all want is good health care for people. In the United States, as I said on the video, we spend more than twice as much per capita on health care as the next closest nation. And yet, it's a disaster. And we can do so much better than that. So I've actually you know, proposed other ways to do things. Um, First of all, you know, I do believe that the use of technology is a tremendous boon for us. You know, telemedicine, I've, you know, been to some of the universities where that's really pushed in a big way. It really provides much better care, particularly for people in, in distant rural areas. Um, being able to use telemetry and get data to people who can interpret it. Tremendous advance, no question about it. One of the exciting things in neurosurgery uh, is the development of robotics. Right now, the standard robotics are too gross and too cumbersome. But uh, you know, I, I and some other people have been working with some inventors. There's stuff coming that is really amazing through a, a, a relatively small access point. You know, you can put something into the basilar cistern and blow it up the size of this room and see all the perforators, find a base of an aneurysm, encircle it, close it off, 
through minimally invasive surgery, patient goes home in a day or two. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are coming. And it really is extraordinarily exciting. Some, sometimes people get concerned and they say, well, that's going to put me out of business. It's not going to put you out of business. It's actually going to create more business because there will be actually more things that can be done as we develop these technologies. And it's really going to be up to our imagination and creativity. And it also removes, uh, you know, some of the, the problems because, you know, face it, it's not something we like to talk about in medicine, but some people just really aren't that good, you know? And, uh, you know, it kind of eliminates that. And, you know, they, they have good brains, you know, they, they can think well, but my God, you wouldn't want them to operate on your dog. So, uh, <laughs> so it, it kind of eliminates that whole thing and, and just lets that intellect flow. And I think that's going to be extremely good for, for all people. But another thing that I think is very helpful, particularly in terms of, of saving money, electronic medical records. Um, you know, you, you're skiing and you fall down, you break your ankle and you're taken to the hospital. And you have your electronic medical record embedded in a credit card, your ring, a necklace, something on you. They can pop it in a computer, get your data, what you're allergic to, what medicines you're on, what surgeries you've had before. You know, an x-ray is done, maybe they see a little spot on your chest and go back and see, was that spot there before? How long has it been there? You know, these kinds of things not only enhance safety, but tremendous cost. Now, you know, I've advocated that that information, however, always be kept with the patient and not made public, not available uh, in cyberspace. Because your personal medical information is very private information. There's absolutely no way that anybody else should have access to that without your permission. And I feel extremely strongly about that, but we have the technology to be able to do that now. Health savings accounts the key linchpin uh, for, the, for the system that I've proposed. People, and there are various ways to fund that for much less money than is paid traditionally. And with your HSA, you get to decide who you want to see. You get to decide, along with your health care provider, what test you need. And think about it, when you're the one who's responsible, Doctor's not going to order five CAT scans when you only need one. You're not going to let him order five CAT scans. He's not going to want to do it because he knows that impacts upon your HSA. So it's going to make people a lot more careful about things. They're going to be looking at the cost. People are also going to be looking for efficiency and effectiveness because now they are the ones that are responsible. I remember in the United States when the food stamp program uh, first came out, a lot of people were skeptical. They said, you know, if you give food stamps to, to people who are irresponsible, they, they won't know what to do with them. And they'll go out, you know, they'll buy porterhouse steak the first five days, and then they won't have any money left, and they'll be saying, I'm going to starve. But it didn't work that way. People very quickly learned how to apportion their food stamps so that they lasted until their next allocation, the next month. People are not stupid, and, or, or less, some aren't. Uh, <laughs> and, and they will generally learn uh, what to do with that money. And if you have a, a HSA, and you, know, you sprain your ankle, and if you need an x-ray done, it comes out of your HSA. You need a physical exam done for a job, it comes out of your HSA. Birth control pills comes out of your HSA. So, you know, there's no Hobby Lobby type lawsuits where you're saying, you know, they, they should be paying for this. No, you pay for it yourself. And you have relatively few things that impact upon your major medical insurance, your catastrophic insurance. So guess what? The cost of that plummets. Sort of like a homeowner's insurance that has a high deductible. 
you don't impinge upon it very often, the cost goes down very, very dramatically. And you know, I've had a lot of uh, medical economists cost this out. It would cost considerably less money. The other thing is uh, you provide an opportunity for people to shift money in their HSA within a family. So let's say the dad is $500 short. He can get that $500 from his wife. She can transfer it to him from his HSA, or his son, or his granddaughter, or his father, anybody in the family. Think about the flexibility that that provides. Uh, you'll be able to cover virtually anything except something that's very, very major. And that would come, of course, out of your catastrophic insurance, which you can also purchase. Because the money doesn't disappear if you don't use it. It just continues to accumulate. And some of the systems that we have now, at the end of the year, it all recalibrates. And you, only, and you have a limit. For instance, with Obamacare, with HSAs, you have a $2,500 limit. You have no limit here. It can accumulate to whatever you want. And there are many sources uh, that can contribute to it. And um, it works extraordinarily well. And when, you're, when you die, you can pass it on to a member of your family. So, you know, you're 87 years old, you got 13 diseases, and, you know, you you get to decide, let's see, I got all this money in my HSA. Should I spend every last dime of it being put into ICUs and poked and prodded until I utter my last word and give up my last breath? Or should I pass it to my daughter or my granddaughter? That's gonna be a pretty easy decision. And you're not going to have all these people talking about death panels and all this kind of stuff. And these are the kinds of things that really empower people in their own lives. It also brings the whole medical care system into the free market economy. That's what actually drives price and quality. So there's incentive for pricing, there's incentive for quality. All of these things are going to work extremely well. And uh, you will have an opportunity from afar to see the battle that uh, is going to rage. Because, um, you know, Obamacare is not going to work. It's, it's not sustainable financially. It's going to collapse. But I'm not sure it was ever meant to work. Um, it was meant to create a catastrophe so that you could go to single-payer system. Uh, but we're going to have another system in place that people will understand and will desire, so I don't think that that's going to happen. But it's one of the reasons, though, that I feel it is so important for us, for people who are actually involved in health care, who actually understand health care, to be the ones who craft the solutions for healthcare. Not for bureaucrats, who may mean well, but they do things the way bureaucrats do things. And we need to do things in a logical way. We need to be able to look at history and see how you know, that is integrated into the solutions that we propose. And it will make all the difference in the world. The other thing that I don't know, you may not have this problem in this nation, but tort reform. Uh, you cannot have physicians practicing medicine with the constant threat of a lawsuit because it affects the way that you do things. It makes you order more things than you should order. It completely alters what you're doing. It changes relationships between you and patients. And what you have to have is some type of a no-fault system uh, where you do take care of people who sustain medical injuries. But the cost of taking care of those people will be considerably smaller than the cost that we incur now with all these lawsuits, which do nothing but make lawyers rich and uh, don't really, in many cases, help the patients that much. We need to be able to immediately take care of their issues make them whole, and keep people working without being stressed, 
without being pulled into court, without having things hanging over their head. And, you know, I asked Howard Dean, who ran for president some years ago. Some of you may recognize that name. Uh, he was the guy who said, and then we're going to Michigan, and then we're going, yeah! And, then, and it kind of ruined, everybody thought he was a nut. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, I don't agree with him on much. Uh, he is a physician, a pediatrician, but he's a nut. But, uh, but he is an honest nut. And, uh, you know, he was at a public forum, and they said, uh, why is there no tort reform in the Affordable Care Act? And he said, because the Trial Lawyers Association gives us a lot of money, and they don't want it in there. And that's always a problem when you have a lot of special interest groups dealing with things. As far as I'm concerned, the only special interest group for us in medicine should be the patient. Thank you.